Well, we're now through the second week of what I would call the intense phase of the COVID-19 crisis. COVID-19 is now a reality in our city. So how are you doing? And what are we going to do now? Really, you and me, what are we going to do? I mean, that's the question every one of us keeps asking as the situation keeps changing by the hour. Like, you could just spend your day watching one depressing news conference after another from the Prime Minister to each of our uh, provincial premiers to the RMWB. Now that most of you are homeschoolers, how's that going? Uh, as you may have heard, uh, if you want a little help on the Christian education front, uh, join our uh, Kid City Facebook page. They'll be posting lots of good stuff for you to use at home. But then there are travel bans, borders closed, politicians making huge financial promises, sports and theater are gone, and toilet paper and hand sanitizer and Lysol wipes are still flying off the shelves. So it's continuing to be a very scary time for a lot of us. It's a time of incredible uncertainty. We just don't know what tomorrow will hold, let alone, yeah, the next six months. So what are we going to do? And what are we as Fort City family, what are we going to do? Last week, we used the story of Jesus walking on water and the terror that created for the disciples in their fishing boat being tossed back and forth by the wind and the waves as a backdrop for working through our fear of COVID-19 and the uh, drop in oil prices. This week, I, I want to use the story of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea being delivered from the Egyptians to again uh, help us to see... Uh, how much the writers of the Bible have to say about living in an uncertain and scary world. And I want to acknowledge Gene Apple as I'm grabbing a few thoughts from this pastor this morning for my message. Okay, fear. Really, it's the natural inclination we all have right now because we all naturally fear the unknown. We fear what cannot be seen. But you know, faith. Faith is also believing in the unknown or the unseen. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Last week, I, I said that the command you find most often in the Bible is fear not. Like depending on your translation, it turns up about 366 times in the Bible, one for every day of the year plus leap year. Fear, it turns up more, fear not turns up more than any of the Ten Commandments. It turns up even more than the command to love God and love your neighbor. You know, when the angels announced the birth of Jesus, they said, fear not. Some of the last words of Jesus that he shared with his disciples in the upper room was, fear not. So the question for you and me is, are we going to live by fear or by faith? And to look at that question this week, we're, we're going to look at a very fearful moment in the history of Israel. It's found in the Old Testament book of Exodus chapter 14. We'll put parts of it up on the screen. You can follow along in your own Bible if you want or on your Bible app. Most of you, you already know the scene, at least those of you 40 and over because you've seen the movie. And if you haven't seen this classic movie, like it was made in 1956, long before most of us were born, including me, so while it isn't up to today's production standards, man, it is awesome. And hey, you got time right now. You've got to watch the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. And this is before Heston became famous for being president of the National Rifle Association in the U.S. Seriously, you should watch the movie. Rent it on YouTube. In fact, I have a suggestion. Watch the movie as a family and then talk about fear and trusting God. Use it with your kids as a follow-up to today's message. Rent it on YouTube. It's a very family-friendly movie. Well, here's the scene. There's a body of water right in front of the people of Israel called the Red Sea. They're camping out on the edge of this pretty significant body of water with their leader, Moses. There might be maybe at this point two million of them. And there's the Egyptian army coming after them. It's, it's only been a, a few days since the ten plagues swept through and devastated Egypt and the angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites, sparing their firstborn sons, but taking out the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. With such devastation and death, Pharaoh finally releases the Israelites after centuries of oppression and slavery. But Pharaoh has a change of mind. And now the Egyptian army is coming after the Israelites in full force. 
the Israelites, they, they hear the hoofbeats of the horses and the roar of the chariots and they see the cloud of dust and they know that they're in trouble, like big trouble, and they're afraid. They're really afraid. Let's look at the story. Tradition tells us that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Some people dispute this, but it's definitely possible. So this is likely a first-hand account. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. There were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord like they're simply afraid. Of course they are. And they get sarcastic with Moses. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out? brought us up out of the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Right away, you know, they catastrophize. They go to worst case scenarios. Hey, the Israelites are understandably having a very natural human reaction to the situation where their backs are up against a wall. And we see three reactions in this story. One, they're afraid. They're full of fear. Two, they, they get sarcastic with their leader, Moses. And then lastly, they start imagining worst-case scenarios. It's kind of a crazy cycle that's real easy to get into. You're afraid. You then get real sarcastic with leaders or other people. I mean, politicians in particular. You won't believe what they did. Oh, that was one great decision. When will our politicians ever get their act together? And we move into kind of a, a helpless victim mentality. And before you know it, we, we start imagining worst-case scenarios and we see everything going to pieces. It's a crazy cycle. And I just keep going around and around and around in this cycle. And, and while this is very human and quite understandable, it is not helpful. And, and really, it's destructive. Think about it. If you cave into fear and sarcasm and worst-case scenarios right now, where is that going to take you? Is there a better plan? Is there a better way than that? Before I talk about the better plan that we see in this story, let me just talk about what it's like when we're afraid. Like, we read the Israelites were terrified. So let me ask you this question. Do you tend to make better or worse decisions when you're terrified, when you're afraid? For instance... Do you think that you're going to use any more toilet paper than normal in the weeks and months ahead? Have you hoarded enough Purell to take baths in the stuff, right? Okay, I'll admit, I have lots of books with titles like The Worst Case Survival Guide, um, and I survived to a magazine that's a, a bit out there called Survivor's Edge. I'm not a prepper at all, but I, I'm big on living in the bush and all the ways that you can do that. Uh, in my scouting days, we called it campcraft, uh, uh, just how you can live out in the bush and how you can survive when the infrastructure around you fails you. And, and I just think stuff like this is really cool to read. I read a survival article that included this information from the U.S. Peace Corps manual for volunteers who work in the Amazon jungle. This is really cool stuff. It's how to react if you are attacked by an anaconda snake, the largest snake in the world, like 35 feet long. That's like 10 or 11 meters and can swallow a 140 to 180 kilogram animal, which for us boomers here is 300 to 400 pounds, okay? The manual reads, if you were attacked by an anaconda, don't run. The snake is faster than you. Lie flat on the ground. Put your arms tight against your side and your legs tight against one another and tuck in your chin. And listen to this. The snake will come and begin to nudge and climb over your body. Do not panic. No problem, right? Everyone good so far? After the snake has examined you, it will begin to swallow you from the feet end, always from the feet end first. Permit the snake to swallow your feet and ankles. Do not panic. The snake will now begin to suck your legs into its body. You must lie perfectly still. This will take a long time. Oh, yeah. When the snake has reached your knees, slowly and with as little movement as possible, 
reach down, take your knife, and very gently slide it into the side of the snake's mouth between the edge of the mouth and your leg. And then suddenly rip upward, severing its head. Last point. Be sure to have your knife. Yeah. I used to carry one in my backpack all the time, but would forget about it when I was traveling and airport security was never impressed. But yeah, friends, it's natural when your back's against the wall to be afraid. But think about it. We, we make our worst decisions in fear. In fear, you might run in panic from an anaconda when you really need to stay still. Yeah, stay still, right? And then you go sarcastic and you blame others and act as if you're the victim, as if you're helpless. When you're scared, when you're afraid, you tend to go sarcastic. And all that does is compound the problem. And then you just move into worst case scenarios. The Israelites said, oh, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. The writer of Aesop's Fables once said, my life has been full of terrible misfortunes most of which never happened. Jesus, he asked this question, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Right? So the Israelites are out in the desert and they're afraid and they get sarcastic with Moses and they are all imagining worst case scenarios. We're all going to die. And Moses, he then puts on a clinic in leadership and crisis management and says, hey, time out everyone. This is not helping. We need to let go of this crippling fear. And then Moses outlines a better plan. And it's good. And it's good for us for what we're up against right now. It's good for Fort McMurray, for Alberta, for Canada, for the world. Moses says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And the plan, it's it's all there in that verse. Moses says, we're going to abandon the scared, sarcastic, worst-case scenario plan, and and we're going to replace it with a let-it-go plan. First, we're we're going to adopt a no-fear mentality. Then, we're just going to stand firm. And finally, we're just going to expect God to help. That's the plan. Fear not, stand firm, expect God's help. You, You might want to write those three things down or note them in your phone, because I tell you, it is a better plan. This is a plan that will help you when your back's against the wall. And it comes from one of the great God-inspired leaders of the Bible, Moses. Fear not, stand firm, and expect God's help. You should write those three things down. Okay, let's quickly unpack this three-point plan a little bit. Let's first talk about what it means to fear not, to not be afraid. And some of you, I get it, you're wondering, is that even possible to fear not when you're freaked out and your back's against the wall? I just got to tell you this. Our God does not give us commands that he will not help us to keep. I believe that with God, with Jesus in us, it is possible to tame the wild, irrational, fearful thoughts that flood into our souls and minds. We can do this. With God, we can do this. And even if you're not a believer, God has wired us to be able to do this And I know not all of you are fans of our Prime Minister, but as he's been self-isolating with his wife who has COVID-19, are they freaking out? No, not at all. At least not from what we can see. Or or maybe a better example for some of you are the actors, Tom Hanks and his wife, Rita Wilson. Uh, Are they freaking out? No. What's their response? Are they going, oh no, we're going to die. This is the end of the world. No. Listen to what Tom tweeted. Hello, folks. Rita and I want to thank everyone down under who are taking such good care of us. We have COVID-19 and are in isolation, so we do not spread it to anyone else. There are those for whom it could lead to a very serious illness. We are taking it one day at a time. There are things we all can do to get through this by following the advice of experts and taking care of ourselves and each other. No. Remember, despite all the current events, there is no crying in baseball. All right. He wrote that before the baseball season was canceled, so maybe that's a bad illustration. I don't know. Maybe you think both the illustrations are bad, but hey. The Apostle Paul says this to a young leader named Timothy. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Friends, with the Holy Spirit filling you, you can have the discipline to not freak out. God, he wants to give that to you. 
the ability to not freak out. You can do this. And if you're struggling with this, send us a message. We'll get our prayer team praying for you. Ask to connect with our prayer team. Someone from our prayer team can phone you and pray for you. And then Moses says, stand firm. And you know, if there's one thing going through the wildfire four years ago taught me, it's that I can let go of my fear because I have a God who will never let go of me. Many of us have miracle after miracle story from the fire. So I can just stand firm and trust. Firm in the belief that you just let go of fear because you have a God who will never let go of you. And you just kind of position yourself to see God work. And that's what Moses did. And then he just expected to see God work. In the wildfire four years ago, I, I, I didn't want to, but we were directed to drive north. I wanted to go south. I prayed to go south. We eventually decided as we were going north to turn around at the Suncor overpass when we heard that the highway south had just been reopened. Uh, I knew that just going straight south on 63 wouldn't work, so I weaved my way to uh, a back intersection I thought I could sneak through at Confederation and Egler. Uh, but unfortunately, there was a responsible RCMP officer pushing us all to go back north. Somehow, the RCMP knew that there would be guys like me trying to go where they didn't want us to go. I had thought about, there's a part, not quite the Birchwood Trails that t attach onto Tower Road, um, but uh, looked over at whether I could get my vehicle into there, and uh, my daughter's just looking at me as no way. Um, she'd already said to me, why did we go south? You're about to kill us all off. So, you know, and there was, you know, a lot of smoke coming that way. So I didn't do that. But still, I was sure that God wanted me to go south. I, I kept pointing at the RCMP officer that I wanted to go left, not right, on the, on the road there, and he kept pointing the other direction. But eventually, he got on his phone, and after a short conversation, he let me and two others go, and then suddenly stomped everyone else. Three vehicles alone on Confederation right through to the bridge. We drove through flames and smoke so thick that you couldn't see the road or anything. But we got across a bridge. We got south. We eventually set up an evacuation service uh, center at Beulah Alliance Church in Edmonton. I mean, God worked. He really did. He delivered. He really did. And we set up church within a church at Beulah. And we had this awesome evacuation center serving the people of Fort McMurray. God turned up. It was awesome. You know, I would never, ever, ever wish a wildfire on anyone, but it was in the wildfire that I experienced God in some new and incredibly life-changing ways. You know, when you are afraid, what you believe about God is revealed. When the pressure is on and you're out of options, you, you do have two options, fear or faith. And, and you know, there's kind of a tricky thing about all this. God tends to wait for you to declare your faith that you are standing firm before he supernaturally intervenes. God never told the Israelites that he was going to part the Red Sea. He just told them to stand firm. And the Israelites, they're freaking out. They're scared. They're sarcastic. They're imagining worst-case scenarios. And look at what God says to Moses. Why? Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites, move on. I love that. Quit the grumbling and the whining and the freaking out. Stop even praying about it. Quit being scared, sarcastic and catastrophizing. Just move on and step towards the very thing you fear in faith. And they step into the water and they still don't know what God is going to do. And he does one of the most awesome miracles of all time. He creates a wind and the wind drives the waters back and all two million Israelites go through the very thing they fear and they end up safe on the other side. And here's what you need to see. God didn't take the Israelites around the Red Sea. He didn't build a bridge over the Red Sea. He, he didn't dig a tunnel under the Red Sea. God took them through it. Friends, He's going to take us through this crisis if you let him. Now, those of you raised in church know how the Egyptian army race into the Red Sea, coming after the Israelites to recapture them as slaves, uh, take them back to impress them for greed and money. And, and when these Egyptians get into the middle of the sea, God instructs Moses to put his staff down and the walls of the water collapse and all the Egyptians drown. It is a horrific judgment on the Egyptians. But you can imagine how that impacted the faith of the Israelites to face fear in the future 
and how at that point that led to one incredible time of worship. Can you believe what God did? Praise God. Have you ever seen anything like this? God made a water wall to get us out of calamity. What a mighty God we serve. Okay, let me tell you where I'm at these days with all that's going on around us. Friends, I really don't want to be a part of the fear-filled, sarcastic, worst-case scenario crowd. I just don't. I'm throwing myself in with Moses and saying, I'm in the fear not, stand firm, and believe with God's help that our greatest days are in front of us group. How about you? Will you join me? And friends, this is a time for Fort City to keep being the church. This is a time to keep doing what God has called us to do, to, to lead people, including our kids, to live in life, to live in love like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a time to serve our city as the hands and feet of Jesus, full, full of the Spirit. We will, and I invite you to be a part of this. We will be a church that lifts high the name of Jesus, who loves us and remains in control of this messed up world, who wants to work through us to show his love to our city. We're not going to shrink back and run and hide. We're going to seize the moment and advance God's mission through Fort City. I believe that is exactly what God wants us to do. So watch our Facebook page, our Kids City page, our, our video posts and our emails for how you can be a part of what we are doing. A lot of you signed up last week to help in this crisis. You can still do that. And if you don't get our emails, a message us with your email address and just get yourself connected to us. You know, tomorrow, you will write a new chapter in your story. And I pray that you will not write it with a fear-based pen, but that you will choose to write it with a faith-based pen. Today, I call you to a better plan. I call you to the Moses plan. I call you to fear not, stand firm, and expect God's help. I call you with the strength of the Holy Spirit to let your fears go and say, with God's help, I will stand firm and I will let go of, I will let go of fear because I have a God who never let go of me. Because I serve a God who split the Red Sea in half, who brought the Christmas miracle of Jesus into this world, the, the Good Friday miracle of sins forgiven and the Easter Sunday miracle of the resurrection of Jesus who overcame death itself for you and me. Friends, knowing all of that, why wouldn't I believe that he would part the waters for me? Let's pray. And I just invite you to take the words that I pray and pray them on your own as your own pray, prayer. Will you just do, join me for a time of prayer? Lord Jesus, today I seek you. And I ask you to fill me with your peace that passes all understanding. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, your spirit of peace. Today I declare before you, Lord God, that with your help I will not fall into the crazy cycle of fear, sarcasm, and catastrophizing worst-case scenarios. Today, I choose to live by faith. So God, help me to get on the fear-not plan and help me to be disciplined to take fearful thoughts captive and just put them aside. God, would you give me the ability to stand firm? I commit to standing firm, knowing that you will never let go of me. Help me to have faith, believing that I can expect you to help. Father God, we believe. We believe that you are for us. We believe that help is on the way and that the waters are going to part. And we look forward to that big-time water parting you will do in our time and in your way. We declare our faith in you today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.